the reason why capitalism gets a bad name is when people want to take without giving, when they just want to do whatever they can and squash other people and say, hey, it's not personal, it's business. That's what a-holes say right before they steal your money. Capitalism could be effective if it wasn't just about the very few people leveraging the rules of derivatives and, and margin and Wall Street by telling everybody else to scrimp and save and sacrifice or that it takes money to make money while they make money on your money. Hey, this is Garrett Gunderson, and one of the interviews that's had the most popularity on my YouTube channel is an interview that Robert Kiyosaki and I did for like there's the full length. It's like an hour and 40 minutes going back and forth. And uh, with all those comments, my team also thought, well, it'd be interesting to see what your opinion is on a reaction video. So let's see how this goes. And it's not covered in anything. It's uh, the only value it has is trust. I don't really want to do this interview anymore. If you want to find out what I know or tell me what you know, then don't interview me. Okay. Just you, you do your own stupid show. I'm trying to tell you something here and you want to okay. tell me how smart you are. That's very egotistical. I'm, I'm here because I'm stupid. Let's get well, that then straight. Well, let me explain something then, damn it. Let's do it. I'm trying to explain to you when they tell you get out of debt, that's stupid because the money is debt. And the only way money gets out of debt is via taxes. So all the people who work for money, red, rich, dad, poor debt, what's lesson number one? Rich people don't work for money. Correct. Money is debt. I use debt as money. And everybody thinks getting in debt is bad. Well, who told you that? I think the stock market is for losers. Why would you put money in the stock market when it's manipulated? That's what I think about. So I'm always watching the manipulation going on behind the scenes. That's what my brain is focusing on all the time. And I don't pay taxes. The question is, how is it I don't pay taxes? And I can tell you. Uh-oh. He says he doesn't pay taxes, but I guess he might be meaning income tax. And yeah, a lot of business owners, especially because he has a lot of real estate, might not pay. But there's 12 other taxes. And he owns property, so he pays a lot of property taxes. And people get really fired up when they're like, here's someone that's super rich that doesn't pay taxes. Income tax is only one tax. And basically, the government incentivizes you and gives you tax incentives if you're reinvesting in things that they're not really capable of handling, like housing or different things like that. So, so there's property tax, there's death tax, there's sales tax, there's excise tax. We can go through all this. Let's be clear. He's talking about income tax. And yeah, maybe because there's so much debt that he has, because he talks about always using debt. But let's be clear. <laughs> debt and what he's saying is debt are two different things. So if we look at a balance sheet, it's assets versus liabilities. If he buys a property for a million dollars and borrows 500,000 because he bought it right, because he found it in distress and, or somehow he you know, swooped in and could buy it quickly and borrows 500 grand, but the property's worth a million, that's 500,000 of equity. Yet the world's calling that $500,000 liability debt. So we're confusing and collapsing what debt is. And for a lot of people, if they try to use so-called debt, they go get loans and they buy a property, but they don't have any knowledge about property management or how to get renters or if it's the right location or what their exit strategy is. Ultimately, debt starts to consume them or those liabilities add up and they have more that they owe than the assets attached to it. And if you're thinking that what he's saying with debt is, I'm going to go buy something and consume it with a credit card, that is real debt. That is not leverage in a positive manner. That is not using a liability to access an equity, but because it's confusing and because so many people go, oh, Dave Ramsey says stay out of debt. Robert Kiyosaki says get in debt. You better know what you're doing because if you're borrowing money to consume, that's going to decimate you. If you're borrowing money to buy something you know nothing about, it's not part of your investor DNA, you don't know how to handle it, that can also be problematic. And uh, let's be really clear. He's still paying tax, maybe just not income tax, because when you're a real estate professional, you get uh, depreciation. If you own commercial properties, you get something called cost segregation. And then you also have a bunch of other incentives that allow you to write tons of things off from an income standpoint, but not from a property tax standpoint. That's an, that's an important question, because most people are so, most Romanians and most people in the United States cheat on their taxes because they hate taxes so much. But uh, I'm a dual citizen in Italy, so one of the places I'm a citizen in. They cheat on their taxes there. It's like a, a art form for the Italians not to report their income. I'm here to tell you, if you don't report your income in the United States and you get caught, 
you're going to get in a lot of trouble. If you think you're a sovereign citizen and you don't have to pay taxes because it's a voluntary system, plan on going to jail. If be, I don't agree with him that most people cheat on their taxes. I think that if you're a business owner or a real estate investor, there is a lot of loopholes and, and ways to navigate the tax code that you can legally and ethically not pay. But I'm here to say I pay income tax, but I don't pay extraordinary amounts of income tax in comparison to my income because I look at what we can do uh, from a tax deduction and a reclassification of income. But I, I, I don't know, I feel concerned when he's like, I pay zero tax, uh, that does concern me. You don't have to cheat on taxes if you understood how money was working. You think Donald Trump pays taxes? No. Well, we, we just had the uh, New York Times put out an article about him not paying a lot on income tax. But again, income tax is one tax. There's payroll tax, right? Self-employment tax, which is FICA FUTA. And yet we get hung up on one thing. Yet there's so many other taxes that we really should be considering and looking, how do we maximize our production rather than just minimize our tax? We want to legally and ethically minimize tax, but we don't want to do it at the expense of our production, which I call the tax tail wagging the dog. The greatest tax shelter in the world, earn another dollar. Always look to produce more, add more value, and create services. There's too many people that go in gas and oil because they think it's a tax deduction, then they lose their money. Sure, if you lose your money, that's a tax deduction, but you lost a dollar to save 30 cents. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Mm, nobody has seen his tax returns. Yeah, I know him. He's my friend. We don't pay taxes. That's the question. How is it we do that? That's an intelligent question. The reason you can't ask me this question because you don't know how I do it. That's what I'm thinking about. I'm constantly thinking about how do I make money? How do I serve more people? How do I create new businesses? I like that, the second one. If you flip flop and said, how do I serve more people and therefore make more money? That's a much better kind of mindset. When people always think, oh, how do I make more money? Sometimes they want to do that at the expense of people. They think it's a zero sum game. I take from other people, it's a finite pie. There's only so much to go around. That creates this competitive nature and collaboration is the key. So I love to hear him say, how do I serve more people? That is the real question to ask. Make more money and pay less taxes and serve more people. Okay, so you said you're a friend of Donald Trump. And do you agree with his uh, economical policies? Because now we've been- be I don't wanna talk about Donald Trump. You can go talk about whatever you wanna talk about. He brought up Donald Trump, but now he doesn't wanna talk about him. I love it. I wanna talk about what I know about. Well, it, I don't, it, it's, it's supposed to be an interview. And I'm trying to yeah, give a little talk context about to my what viewers. You wanna talk about. I don't wanna talk about Donald Trump. Okay, what would you like to talk about? Let, I just told well, you, money and debt. Money and debt, Money, okay. debt, and taxes, because that's what money is. Okay. And the person has been told to go to school, get a job, and work hard, you're gonna pay taxes. Why? Because Yeah, when you're a W-2 employee, you definitely pay more in tax than when you're a real estate investor or a business owner, no doubt. And unfortunately, a lot of people, they think I'm gonna go to school, I'm gonna get good grades, I'm gonna get a job. I feel like that's a little bit of the thing of the old, like there's not as many people really buying into that myth anymore. Yeah, for the right profession, if you know what you're up to, the right school for you, maybe. But the reality is, when we, when we look at this old, whole situation that he's talking about, there's so many people that are doing jobs that they don't like so that one day they can retire. What about building a life that you don't want to retire from? What about finding value creation consistent with what your real abilities are? What about taking that extra time to think and create a vision and determine what your career is going to be rather than just trade time for money and hope that one day it's going to get better? For far too many people, they're not engaged in what they do. They're doing it by simply getting by and that scarcity breeds mediocrity and it creates poverty. The reality is how we think, what we, what we view, how we help people, how we help ourselves. There's, a, there's so much to that in actually creating more wealth. And I do think Robert understands that. For money. So the question, well, how does a person not work for money and pay no taxes? So I was trying to give a little context to my viewers. Romanians don't understand so much about capitalism. And from what I'm reading and what I'm learning, most of America Unfortunately, capitalism has become a lot more like cronyism. So cronyism is basically major corporations, you know, getting politicians on their side, funding campaigns so they could do things that might not be in the best interest of the people. And capitalism, like, is different than free market exchange because anytime we add an ism, whether it's communism, socialism, or capitalism, the reason why capitalism gets a bad name is when people want to take without giving, when they just want to do whatever they can and squash other people and say, hey, it's not personal, it's business. That's what a-holes say right 
before they steal your money. Capitalism could be effective if it wasn't just about the very few people leveraging the rules of derivatives and, and margin and Wall Street by telling everybody else to scrimp and save and sacrifice, or that it takes money to make money while well, they make money on your money, or tell you it's about waiting for 30 years when they cash flow from day one. It's really important to learn what really is going to create wealth instead of just following, you know, I'll color within the lines, I'll invest it, I'll set it and forget it, invest early, often, and always. Robert knows that these are problems, and, you know, he seems a little bit grouchy, but, but he knows a lot about certain things and other things I don't always see eye to eye on. It's also, they shift from understanding capitalism as freedom to thinking of it as in a bad way. What should the people understand about this way of living? Because we cannot all be entrepreneurs. Some people need to get some jobs. Or should we all try and look at how we can change our lives in, in the way you show it in your books and your keynotes? It's up to the person. It's up to the person. It's a free, free choice. You want to be an employee, you choose to be an employee. You want to be an entrepreneur, you choose to be an entrepreneur. But you've got to study. They're two, two different people. But you have and, and what I think is, if people want to be an employee, because we have to have employees to make this thing work. If 100% of people are entrepreneurs, it's harder to collaborate. You know, who's actually going to think about how and when something gets done? Or is a lot, lot more mindful about the details and the implementation? But if you're going to be an employee, look to be an entrepreneur. Look to use entrepreneurial skills inside of an organization where you say, how do I contribute to the bottom line and add to the upside of the potential of me personally, rather than just trading time for money, rather than being stuck on salary, rather than doing things that you hate. You have to study is different. Mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, they're different people. An entrepreneur is extremely different than an employee, but it's a different stuff. Yeah, there's really like four main money personas. One is the miser that's just about scrimping, saving, sacrificing. The whole name of the game is preservation. You know, they'll drive hours to save on gas. They'll, they'll spend hours researching for the best price, not valuing their time. There's the conservative that's all about how can they delay gratification and happiness to accumulate so 30 years from now they can finally live the life that they want, but they kind of find out that they create this habit of never really enjoying it. Then there's the striver that's all about hustling and scaling and working and, and, and you know, doing everything they can to sacrifice so that they could have status. And then finally, there's the high rollers that are just all about investing and they're very speculative and they might win big sometimes, but they lose big other times. And when we understand these different money personas, the key isn't to point out what's wrong about them, it's to identify within those, there's the winning personas. So the miser has a mindful manager, which is very detail oriented, efficient and great at improving things. The conservative on their winning side is a planner that's amazing at being, that's amazing at uh, planning for contingencies and reducing risk and monitoring the effectiveness of any initiative. The striver brings out the creator, which is the entrepreneur that leads others and inspires through innovation and ingenuity. Or we can go to the high roller, their counterpart on the winning side when they focus on value creation first is the catalyst. And they show us how to all win together because they're visionaries and connectors and movers and shakers. So the reality is if we focus on collaboration instead of competition, we can actually go further. If instead of making everybody wrong or thinking they're stupid, we understand, hey, maybe they've been trained, taught, and educated in the wrong paradigm because that's just what they knew or what their family was about, and maybe it's because they're scared and they want to preserve or protect, or maybe it's they just don't know what to do, and instead of we just kind of loved on each other a little bit, and we realized that no matter what your financial resources are, we all have hidden capital, whether it's mental capital or relationship capital. Mental being our ideas, knowledge, wisdom, you know, strategies and tools, or relationship capital being people, networks, organizations, mentors, family, or friends. And the thing is, regardless of where you are financially, you can win, you can get ahead if you focus on you being the greatest asset, investing back into yourself, and then asking, how do I create more value? Robert said that word twice. How do you deliver more value? That's the key. Study, the trouble is our school system trains us to be employees. True. Go to school, get a job. You know, John Dewey was kind of the founder and he wanted 80% of people to just graduate, you know, high school to learn to be an employee, 17% to be dropouts and go out there and do the work that nobody else wanted to do. And it's only reserved about, you know, 3% for these renegades that were alternative thinkers that were trying to do something on their own and kind of buck the system. But yes, it was very deliberate to be more about memorization and more about, and, and hopefully we're evolving from that. But the education that's important is the education as well that you get outside the classroom, emotional intelligence, financial intelligence, 
intelligence, writing, speaking, and communicating, learning how to, you know, collaborate, learning how to, you know, build relationships. These things, which I thought in college were the best part, was building relationships happen outside of the classroom. But there's valuable information there, but it's limited because it isn't going to teach you about money. It isn't going to teach you about entrepreneurship in most cases. It isn't going to teach you about value creation. It's not going to teach you about who you are and what you're capable of doing. And that's the work that we should never give up on or feel like we've arrived. We should continue to learn, not feel like we're learned. Work hard, save money, pay your taxes, get out of debt, and invest in the stock market. That makes you poor. He's right. Or middle You've class had the or chance lower middle to be class. Taught early. You've been challenged early. Most people don't get that chance. Where should people start? Question the saying I just gave you. Go to school. What do you learn about money? Curiosity, asking questions, is a very important key to wealth. When I was 19 and I started in financial services, I had a little red memo pad and I would go, I was interviewing people that I knew were the, you know, and I used my kind of young age to get into a lot of the meetings. I flew to New York. I flew really all over the country for 26 months just to interview because I knew that there was a lot I didn't know coming from a coal mining town as the coal miner's son. I knew about hard work, but I want to know about like, how do I make my money work? And how is it that other people are so much wealthier? What did they know? What did they do? How do they see the world differently? The fact that you just told me that mm, you need to go to get a job to have money. But I didn't say that. You said that. I said that. This is what we've been told. Yeah. So who, go to school, get a job. Yeah. It's all about setting money aside and trading time for money. Instead, what Robert would say is get assets that create cash flow. Figure out your investor DNA is what I would say, because maybe it's not real estate, even though that's something that he does. Maybe it's buying a small business. Maybe it's you know investing in intellectual property where you actually bring some value to the world with the unique knowledge that you have. I mean, but it is not a good idea just to hand your money over to the stock market and hope for the best. And people tell you, oh, it's going to work out in the long haul, or this is what the market's average. That has been disappointing and decimated since the 90s. Question that. OK. So if I'm starting to question that, if a young person is looking at us and they say, OK, I'm ready to challenge that, what do I tell to my father? Oh, yeah, I'm not going to school anymore. I didn't say that. You said that. I said that, of course. I, would, I just said, question it. What's wrong with getting a job? I went through a job to understand how the system works, but I'm not sure if it, it works to anyone. What's your opinion on that? I thought you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Of course, but not everyone has, has done so. So I, I was trying to... And what is lesson number one in Rich Dad, Poor Dad? <sighs> Rich people don't work for money. And so when your school system so you get a job, what are you doing? You become a slave. You work for money. Exactly. And what's wrong with working for money? That it makes you come back to work and be, you become a slave. You pay taxes. And you pay taxes, of course. And then they tell you to save money. Why would you save money when they're printing money? Everybody's printing money now. Uh, are they printing it or just adding the computer screens? Why would you save money when they're printing money? I know you don't save money. You're building businesses. I do believe in having a peace of mind fund, having liquidity, having cash on hand, so when the right opportunities come, you have liquidity to capitalize on those. Far too many people are overly invested, overly leveraged. They don't have access to that capital. So the question I would have if I were interviewing is, how do you access capital? Now, obviously, if you're wealthy enough, you can have a portfolio bank. You have preferred lending ways to get that. But having some cash, it's not about saving and saving and saving for 30 years, but it is about having liquidity. So when those opportunities come, you're in a position to do something about it. So I just want to be really clear about that. Why would you save money when they're printing money? It does kind of devalue. It's kind of frustrating. You have money. It's a number. And then you're like, cool, this is what it's worth. But it continues to change in value because there's this kind of like leaky bucket, which is they're just going to add more money to the system. So whatever you thought you had, the numbers are the same. But what those numbers can do as far as buying or utilizing start to change. We're going to see a massive wealth transfer over the next three years. Those people that are in the know that are buying businesses or treating real estate as a business or creating intellectual property or investing in ways that they can have advanced important skill sets, more than just improving something a little bit, but what is it society is really in need of? Leadership, connection, you know, and if you can really just get the basics around money figured out, I think it makes a massive difference. Because you didn't, I don't know. 
because that's what you've been told to do. Of course. Can I just say it is an awkward interview here? Like it's just it's very awkward and intense. So question that. You see, if you cannot think, I cannot help you. Yeah, we do have to take time to think instead of just do exactly what we're told. I mean, do you want what society has created for you? Is that checking those boxes, provided fulfillment? What even about well-intentioned preachers, teachers, family, and friends? Is that really the life that you want? Get clear about what you want. What is your vision? And vision's beyond a goal or an objective. It's something that requires, you know, help and support and that you have to enroll others in their abilities and maybe even their time because it's beyond your current reach, but it's compelling to you. It's something that you want to live into. And vision is the ultimate container to create value. It tells our brain what's important and what to pay attention to. It's the rarest commodity. And so vision will dictate a lot of the value creation. And so I think part of it is he's saying to think is an important, important step instead of just, oh, I got to go out there and do, I got to go out there and hustle. But why would I save money? when they print money. It That's what money. happened in 1971 when President Nixon took the dollar Went off the, the gold, gold standard. standard. They can print as much as they like. Then they tell you, so that you go to school, you get a job, you become an employee. You pay taxes because you're working for money. Then they okay, so I don't know that we need to finish the video because it just sounds like, hey, guess what? If you just go to work and you pay taxes and you do things that you don't really enjoy for an income that you don't really feel valued with and you don't have much upside potential and then you just simply set your money aside in the stock market through 401ks and IRAs and that isn't really going to teach you how to create cash flow and then hopefully one day someday you can retire because you don't enjoy what you do that's not a game worth playing that's a game that's been designed by everyone but yourself it's time for you to stand up for yourself get educated determine what you want in this world find out how you can be the biggest value creator possible and create a vision that you never want to retire from. Want to master your money? Want to figure out the things that you could do to improve your finances? Click here and check out more videos like this on Money Matters.